Hi everybody, and welcome to this introduction to Java graphics programming, where we will be learning the basics of creating 2D graphics in Java. We'll start by learning how to create some basic shapes and how to combine them to create even more shapes. And then after that, we'll learn how to create paths and curves, as well as how to apply some basic graphics transformations. I hope you enjoy this lesson, and now let's begin. Let's start by creating a J-frame. I'll just put all the J-frame code here inside the main method to simplify the program. So if we run this, then we should have an empty J-frame. Next, we will create a class that extends the abstract class known as JComponent. JComponent is part of the Swing package, and one of its uses is for creating graphics in Java. You can think of this class as the canvas where we will draw the artwork. Aside from the javax.swing package, let's also import java.awt so we can use the color and the graphics classes. We'll talk more about those later. And then there's java.awt.jump so that we can create shapes and paths. More on these later as well. jComponent is an abstract class, so we won't be able to directly instantiate a jComponent object. Instead, we are going to have to extend jComponent and then create an instance of this new class. I've decided to name this class Drawing Canvas. And then let's declare fields named width and height, which we will use to store the width and height of the JFrame. We don't really need to do this, but it can be useful if we want to set the size and position of our shapes relative to the width and height of the frame. Later on, we're going to use these fields to add a solid background to our GUI. And then we have a constructor where we initialize the width and height fields. The next thing we need to do is to override the method of the jComponent class known as paint component. This is the method signature of this method. It is a protected method with a return type of void and it accepts a graphics object. You can think of this graphics object as the object that's responsible for tasks such as setting the color, drawing lines and curves, and filling shapes, etc. And then inside the body of this method, this is where we will be placing the code that will draw the graphics in our program. You will see later on that when we run our program, this paint component method actually gets called without us having to explicitly call it anywhere. All we need to do is override this method and set it up properly, and Java takes care of the rest. A graphics object automatically gets created and passed to it as well. We also don't need to explicitly make that one. As long as we write the code properly, then Java will do its thing and render the graphics that we created. Now, consider converting the graphics object into what's called a graphics 2D object. You can think of this as an enhanced version of the graphics object. We don't really need to do this. We can just stick with a basic graphics object, but the graphics 2D class has a lot of nice features. For example, it will allow us to apply what's called anti-aliasing in order to make the edges of our shape smoother. Otherwise, the lines and curves in our graphics may appear jagged around the edges. To convert the graphics object into a graphics 2D object, we simply cast the object like so. This takes our graphics object named G and casts it as a graphics 2D object, and then assigns it to a graphics 2D variable named G2D. So now let's draw our first basic shape. Inside the java.awt.jump package are classes that will allow us to draw shapes and paths. Some examples of these classes are ellipse2d.double, line2d.double, path2d.double, and rectangle2d.double. The double means that we can use numerical values that are of the double data type instead of just integers to specify the position and size of the shapes. So for example, we can create a rectangle with a height of 100.75.
Let's start by creating a rectangle using the rectangle 2 dddouble class. We're going to pass to it the desired x and y coordinates to set the position of the rectangle, and then we will provide the desired width and height. So this creates a new rectangle that originates from the coordinate x equals 50 and y equals 75, and has a width of 100 and a height of 250. But how do these coordinates work? With j components, the coordinate where x equals 0 and y equals 0 is located on the upper left of its container. It is not in the center. Increase the value of x to move right and decrease it to move left. For the y coordinate, if you increase the value, you will actually move down while decreasing the value moves up. So for our rectangle, x equals 50 and y equals 75 would be here, and this is where the upper left corner of the rectangle will be positioned. And then our rectangle has a width of 100 pixels and a height of 250 pixels, so this is the space that it's going to take up. Now, creating the rectangle to the object doesn't automatically make the rectangle visible. The object may exist already, but we won't be able to see it unless we draw or fill it with a visible color. To choose a color, we'll use the setColor method of the Graphics2D class and pass to it a new color object. We can instantiate the color object directly here in the method. We give it three arguments to represent the RGB channels, red, green, and blue. Each argument can be an integer between 0 to 255. This particular combination of red, green, and blue values results in the color cornflower blue. You also have the option to use color constants such as color.black, color.blue, color.magenta, and a few other ones. You can search online for a list of the available color constants. And then we can use the fill method of the Graphics2D class and pass to it the shape. This will end up filling the shape with our chosen color. Now to view the drawing, we create an instance of our Drawing Canvas class and we add it to the JFrame. Back here in the main method, we instantiate it and then add it to the JFrame. When we run the program, the paint component method actually gets called. No need for us to explicitly call it anywhere in our code. That's just how Java makes it work. So let's test the program. And here is our rectangle. If we want to add a solid colored background, one way we can do that is by drawing a large rectangle that covers the entire area. We set the rectangle's x and y coordinate values to 0 so that it starts at the upper left corner of the container. And then we make its width and height large enough to cover the whole area. So back here in our paint component method, let's change the rectangle's x and y to 0. And then remember that we pass the JFrame's width and height values to these width and height fields. So we can go ahead and use those to set the width and height of the rectangle so that the shape will be large enough to cover the J component's visible area. So let's test the program. And here we see that we now have a solid colored background thanks to our rectangle. The nice thing about how we wrote the code is that when we change the width and height values, then the background rectangle adjusts accordingly. The new width and height values get passed to the set size method of the JFrame, and the same values also get passed to the drawing canvas so that the rectangle remains large enough to cover the area. So if we test this, we will see that our background still fills up the entire space. Now, if we want to draw a circle, we can use the ellipse2d.double class. Similar to the rectangle, the first two values are for the x and y coordinates, and the last two values are for the width and height. 
This will create a rectangular bounding area as the basis for the size of the circle. If we want to change the color, then we can call set color again and pass to it a new color. Otherwise, it's going to use the previous one. And then we pass the ellipse object to the fill method in order to fill the shape with our newly chosen color. Now to draw a line, we can use the line2d.double class. This allows us to create a line segment. The first two values are for the x and y coordinate of the line segment starting point, and the last two values are for the line segment's ending point, and then the points are connected to create a line. Let's set the color. And then to actually draw the line, we use the draw method of the graphics 2D class and pass to it the line object. So for lines, we use draw instead of fill. Now the order in which the fill and draw methods are called is important because it determines the stacking order of the shapes. If we are filling the rectangle first, then it will appear behind everything. In front of it will be the circle, followed by the line, which will be drawn in front of all the other shapes. So let's test the program. And here we see all of our shapes and in the expected stacking order. Rectangle at the back, circle in front of it, and the line in front of everything. Now when the drawing contains curves and diagonal lines, jagged edges may be apparent, like what you see here around the circle and also with the line. We can use anti-aliasing to smoothen out the edges of the shapes. Applying anti-aliasing will blend the colors of the shape's edges with the surrounding colors, resulting in a smoother rendering of the drawing. To apply anti-aliasing, we'll need what's called a rendering hints object. This class is part of the AWT package. Here, we are passing the rendering hints constructor a key and a corresponding value. This key and value pair determines the algorithm that will be used when the graphics 2D object renders the graphics. There are a few different keys and values that we can choose from, but we won't be discussing them in this lesson. For now, let's just use these settings. Also, you can write this in one line. I just chose to write it this way to make it more readable. And then we pass the rendering hints object to the graphics 2D object using the set rendering hints method. So let's test the program. And here we see that the graphics are a lot smoother now that anti-aliasing has been applied. Okay, so right now we only have three different shapes, and already we have more than 10 lines of code inside our paint component method. The more shapes we create, then the more lines of code we will end up having, and this may make the code become more difficult to maintain. So to declutter our paint component method, we can create separate classes for the different things that we are drawing. Let's take a look at this next example. I've edited the paint component method and removed all the other shapes, but you can just comment them out if you want to keep those lines of code. So now what you see here is that I'm creating four different ellipse objects. They all have different X and Y values and different sizes, but they will all use the same color. When rendered together, this will create the shape of a cloud. It will appear as if it's just one shape, but really it's just a bunch of overlapping ellipses with the same color. But imagine if you wanted to draw more clouds, or any other shapes for that matter. Then we would end up having more and more lines of code all inside our paint component method. To avoid a scenario where the paint component method gets too cluttered, or at least to minimize it, what we can do here is we can take all of these lines for this one cloud and transfer them into their own class. Let's make a class named Cloud. Make sure to import awt and awt.jom. Let's leave the constructor empty for now. And then let's create a method called DrawCloud. This method will accept a graphics 2D object so that we can use it to render the ellipses. 
And then inside this method, let's go ahead and transfer the code from the paint component method that is relevant to drawing the cloud. And then back here in our Drawing Canvas class, we will instantiate a new cloud object and call the DrawCloud method. So I'll go up here and declare a new field, private cloud C1. And then inside the constructor, C1 equals new cloud. So now there is a relationship between the Drawing Canvas class and the Cloud class. The Drawing Canvas now contains one cloud instance. But we still need to render this cloud. So we go here in the Paint Component method, and then we call the Draw Cloud method on our cloud object C1. And then we pass to it the Graphics 2D object. To use an analogy, you can think of the Graphics 2D object as a pen. It's the pen that we are using to draw our graphics. You can think of what we're doing here as passing the pen to the cloud object so that it can draw the multiple ellipses inside it. We don't need to create a separate graphics 2D object. We can just use this original one and pass it to any object that needs to use it. So now when we run the program, What's going to happen here is, when the drawing canvas gets created, the cloud object is then created as well. And then when the paint component method executes, the graphics 2D object is passed to the draw cloud method of the cloud object. The draw cloud method then uses this graphics 2D object to render these ellipses to form the shape of a cloud. So let's test the program. And here we see that the cloud object is successfully drawn. But instead of placing all the code in paint component, we created a separate class for it to make our code more organized. Okay, so now let's go back to the cloud class. Right now, the cloud class is not very reusable. If you make multiple clouds, each instance draws the exact same cloud in the exact same spot, with the exact same size and the exact same color. So to make the cloud class more reusable, we can add instance fields so that we can customize each cloud instance. We can have an X and a Y field to store the cloud's position. And we can have a size field and a color field as well. That way we can make clouds of varying positions, sizes, and colors. In the constructor, let's add parameters that we will use to initialize those fields. And then here in the draw cloud method, instead of hard coding the values for each ellipse, we use the fields instead. In this updated code, the first ellipse uses the X and Y fields to position itself. And then it uses the size field for both the width and the height. And then the second ellipse will have a horizontal position of whatever x is plus 35% of whatever the value of size is. And then its vertical position will be y minus 20% of the size. Its width will be 175% of the size. And its height will be 140% of the size. And then the other ellipses will have their own formulas as well. So we want to calculate these values based on percentages because we want these ellipses to scale and move proportionately based on the values of these three fields. If we change the values of x, y, and size, the cloud's size and position will change without distorting its proportions. If these are the values of x, y, and size, then these will be the resulting values for the ellipses, and the cloud will look like this. If we change the values of x, y, and size to these, then all the other values will change as well. So the first ellipse will now be this big and will be located in this position. 
and the second ellipse will be here. If you take a look at the horizontal position, it now has a new value, but it's still equal to the value of x plus 35% of the value of size. So the new placement is still proportional relative to the previous one. And the same goes for its vertical position and its size. Everything stays in proportion. And so it goes for all these other ellipses as well. Now even though the cloud has a different size and position, its shape is still the same. And then here we set the color using the value of the color field, which allows us to have different colored clouds depending on the value of color. So let's go ahead and save this. And now, back here in the drawing canvas, let's add two more cloud fields. And then in the constructor, let's instantiate these clouds and give them different values for X, Y, size, and color. So here, we have three clouds that will have different values for their instance fields. And then in the paint component method, let's make sure that we draw all of the clouds. So let's test the program. And here we've got our three clouds. Now I just want to add a quick note on the override annotation. I forgot to do this earlier and it's not really required, but it's considered good coding practice to add this whenever you override a method. It can help catch some errors when you make a mistake with the method signature, such as using the wrong name, for example. In this lesson, we'll learn how to create paths and curves and how to apply translation and rotation transformations to our graphics in Java. To start, we have a class that extends jComponent and overrides the paint component method so that we can create our graphics. And then we have a class that has a main method. And in this method, we are setting up our J frame and adding the J component. So let's begin. We can create basic shapes with the help of classes like rectangle 2 dddouble and ellipse 2 dddouble But what about other shapes like triangles, hexagons, octagons, and even shapes that are irregular? For that, we can use the path 2 d dot double class. When you say path, this refers to a collection of connected segments. Let's make an instance of it, and then let's start by calling the moveTo method and giving it x and y coordinates. When creating paths, always begin with moveTo, because this is what allows us to set our path's starting point. And then we use the line2 method and give it x and y coordinates as well for our second point. This draws a line from the previous point to this new one. The difference between line 2 and move 2 is that line 2 creates a line, while move 2 simply goes to a new location. To use an analogy, move 2 would be like lifting your pen off of the sheet of paper and moving it to a different location so you don't end up writing on the sheet in the process while line 2 would be like drawing an actual line from one point to the next. And then we use the draw method of the graphics 2D object and pass to it our path in order to actually draw the shape. Notice that we did not set a color, so when we run this program, the color will default to black. So let's test the program first. And here we see a line that we created using the path 2D object. To add more lines, we can make more calls to the line2 method. After our second point, we can call line2 again and specify another pair of coordinates. And this will create a line connecting these two points. You can make more calls to the line2 method to add more lines. But for this one, I'm going to go ahead and close the path using the close path method to turn this shape into a triangle. This will connect a line back to the point of the last move to method call. So let's go ahead and test the program. And here is our triangle. 
And then you can also use the fill method instead of draw if you want to fill the shape instead of drawing an outline. If you want to draw curved segments, you can use the curve two method. Let's create a new path. And then let's give it a starting point using the move to method. And then we call the curve to method to create the curved segments. This method requires six arguments. These first two pairs of values are for the X and Y coordinates of what are called the Bezier control points. I'll explain what those are for in a bit. And then this last pair is for the segment's end point. So we've got the starting point, the ending point, and the Bezier control points. These Bezier control points will then create what are called the Bezier handles. The starting point connects to the first Bezier control point to create the first Bezier handle. And the ending point connects to the second control point to create the second Bezier handle. These Bezier handles allow you to control the direction of the curve. They're not part of the actual drawing. To illustrate how this works, let's take a look at this example in a graphics editing software, many of which use Bezier handles to control curving paths. Here, I've created a curving path using the pen tool, and here are the path's Bezier handles. If I drag a control point, it moves the handle, and you see how it allows me to sort of push and pull the segment to control the direction of the curve on either side. So here we see that the position of the Bezier handles determine the shape of the curve. Back here in our program, the way these Bezier handles are positioned will end up creating a curve that looks like this. So let's go ahead and draw this path, and then let's test the program. And here we see the curved segment. Now, there's some actual math that's happening here that calculates how the curve is drawn, but we won't be covering that in this video. For now, it suffices that we have a very basic idea of what these Bezier handles do, and you can experiment with them by changing the values. For example, if we move the first control point here, then this would be the result. And in this other example, this creates the shape of a heart. Take note that you can also make calls to both curve two and line two on the same path so that you can create shapes that have both curved and straight or diagonal lines. You are also allowed to make additional calls to the move to method in between line two and curve two. So I encourage you to experiment with the path to the class and try to create different shapes. So now let's take a look at how to apply a type of graphics transformation known as translation. Translation is the process of moving all the points in a given space. Say for example, we translated these shapes by 100 pixels to the right and 50 pixels down. The effect is that they will each shift by the same amount based on their original position. So they all end up moving to different places while maintaining the same distance from each other. So let's take a look at this example. This creates a rectangle with x and y coordinates of 0, 0, which normally will place it in the upper left corner. But not if we call the translate method. We pass to it two values. The first value is for the distance along the x-axis and the second value is for the distance along the y-axis. This means that from the current position, I'm shifting by 150 pixels to the right and 100 pixels down. Take note that we will need to call translate before we call the fill method. Any shapes that have been rendered before the call to translate will not be affected. So let's run this program. And here we see the shape in the expected position. Now take note that the rectangle's x and y values are still 0 and 0. These values are still maintained, but the translation still moves it to a new location. One way you could visualize this is to imagine that instead of changing the rectangle object's x and y values, the translation moved the location of the actual x equals 0 and y equals 0 point in our coordinate space. 
instead of being in the upper left corner, where it usually is, the translation has moved it by 150 pixels to the right and 100 pixels down. So when this rectangle is rendered, it still gets placed at 0, 0, except that 0, 0 is now in this new location. And furthermore, any other shapes that we render from this point on will be referring to this new translation. So if we draw or fill another rectangle at x equals 100 and y equals 150, for example, it's going to be positioned here. So let's run the program. And here is the output as expected. Now take note that succeeding calls to translate will concatenate the translation values. In other words, they will add to the previous one. Let's say I call translate again here with the values 300 and 200. This will shift based on the previous translation. So from here, we move 300 pixels to the right and 200 pixels down. Now these previous shapes will stay in the same location. But any future shapes that we draw or fill after the second translation will now render as if the 0, 0 coordinate is here. So if I create another rectangle at x equals 50 and y equals 50 and fill it after the second translation, it will be positioned here. So let's test the program. And here we see the new rectangle in the expected position. Okay. So now, what if we want to reset the translation? What I mean by this is, what if we want 0, 0 to be moved back up to the upper left corner? What we can do here is, we can negate the total translation amount that we've applied. So far, we've moved a total of 450 pixels to the right, which we get by adding all of the X translations we've made and we've moved a total of 300 pixels down. So to reset back to the original starting point, we translate by negative 450 and negative 300. This means that we move back to the left by 450 pixels and move back up by 300 pixels, effectively canceling out all our previous translations and bringing 0, 0 back to the upper left corner. So now, if we try to fill the first rectangle again, which has an x and y of 0, 0, this new one will be positioned in the upper left corner of the container. Yes, we can draw or fill the same shape object as many times as we'd like. We don't always have to make a new one. Take note also that resetting the translation will not move the previously rendered shapes. Only the new ones will be affected. So let's run the program. And here we see the fourth rectangle being rendered in the upper left corner since we've been able to successfully reset the translation. Now, another way we can reset the translation is by using what's called an affine transform object. An affine transform object contains the values that represent the state of a graphics transformation. This includes information such as how much translation has been applied, how many degrees the objects have been rotated, and so on. To access this information, we can use the getTransform method of the Graphics2D class, and then let's assign it to a variable. For now, let's put that here, after we made the first and second translations, but before the last one that cancels them out. So this will return an affine transform object representing the transformation values at this point in time, which is to say this translation where we've moved a total of 450 pixels to the right and 300 pixels down. This object is not going to have the information from this final call to translate the values that it will store will be only the ones at the time that get transform was called. So if we want to use it as a way of resetting the transformation, then what we need to do here is, instead of calling get transform after we make any transformations, we call it before we apply any transformations whatsoever. In effect, 
we are remembering the original graphics transformation state so that if we make any transformations in the future, we will have the ability to revert back to the original state using this affine transform object. To do that, we can use the set transform method. But first, let me just change the variable name here to reset just to make it more descriptive. And then here, instead of manually canceling out the translations, we replace this with a call to the set transform method and pass to it the reset object. This will overwrite the graphics 2D object's current transformation state and restore it back to the original. So now, Anything rendered after this will be based on the original transformation settings. So let's test this again. And here we see that we get the same results as before, but this time we used unaffined transform object instead. The benefit of resetting the transformation this way is that we don't have to hard code the values that will cancel out the previous transformations. Right now, we're only doing a few transformation calls using Translate, but imagine if we had to do a lot more, then in that case, going with the hard coding approach may very well end up being inefficient and prone to errors. Okay, so if you plan on doing transformations, you can just go ahead and get the affine transform object right away and then use it anytime you want to reset the transformation. You can use this one reset object to reset the transformation values as many times as needed. No need to create multiple ones as long as you remember to get it before you make any kind of transformation. So why do we want to use translate in the first place? Why don't we just change the X and Y values of our shapes instead? Well, the nice thing about Translate is that it allows us to shift everything using one statement. Imagine if we had a lot of shapes in our program that we wanted to move in a uniform manner. With Translate, we can just move all of them using one line of code. Okay, so now let's take a look at how to rotate objects. Rotation is another type of transformation. To rotate our shapes, we can use the rotate method of the graphics 2D class. We pass to it the desired angle of rotation, but the value must be in radians, not degrees. So for example, to rotate by 15 degrees, pass its equivalent value in radians, which is 0 0.261799. But instead of manually calculating this, you can use the math.2radians method. So if you say math.2radians 15 degrees, then this converts it into the equivalent radians value that the rotate method can use. So how does it work? Let's create a rectangle and position it in these coordinates. x equals 250 and y equals 200. And then let's rotate by 15 degrees, and then let's call the fill method. So when a shape rotates, it's going to rotate from a pivot point. The question here is, where is that pivot point? Is it the center of the shape or its upper left corner, maybe? In this case, it's actually neither of those. The pivot point by default is actually here at the 0, 0 coordinate, or the upper left corner of the container. To see how this works, imagine that this is one big sheet of paper and we rotate the entire sheet by 15 degrees, pivoting from the upper left corner. So this would be the result, which might not be what you wanted to happen. You probably wanted to pivot from some part of the actual shape instead. To do that, we can pass additional arguments to the rotate method. Aside from the rotation angle, we can also specify the x and y coordinates of the desired pivot point. Here, 
we specify the same x and y values that the rectangle has. That way, it will pivot from the rectangle's upper left corner, and the result will look like this. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison. In the middle is the rectangle without any rotation applied. On the left, we are using the default pivot point, which is the upper left corner of the container. And on the right, we specified a custom pivot point so that it rotates from the upper left corner of the actual shape itself. Okay, so just like the translate method, succeeding calls to rotate will add to the previous one. In this new example, I am rendering the same rectangle twice using two different colors, green followed by blue. If we test this, we'll only see the blue rectangle because it will be rendered on top of the green one. But we actually have two rectangles right now. Now let's go ahead and apply some rotation. I'll first rotate by 15 degrees before I render the green rectangle. I'll specify the pivot point to match the upper left corner of the rectangle. And then I'll rotate again by another 20 degrees before I render this blue one. So if we test this program, here is the result. The green one is rotated by 15 degrees, and then from there, the blue one rotates an additional 20 degrees. So in effect, the blue one's rotation is 35 degrees in total. If we want the blue one to just rotate by 20 degrees, then we can reset the transformation using an affine transform object before we apply the second rotation. So let's call get transform before applying any transformations. And then let's reset the transformation using set transform before we rotate for the second time. This brings the rotation back to zero degrees. So now the blue rectangle will be rotated by just 20 degrees. So let's save this and then test the program. And here we see the expected angles of rotation, 15 degrees for the green one and 20 degrees for the blue one. All right, so that is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something new. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.